Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Hope everyone's doing well. It's good to be with you one more time. I am Pastor Anthony O. Walker at Transformation Ministries, located at 115 Kathy Avenue. We have our services every Saturday at 12 noon. We start actually prayer at 11.45 a.m., uh, but the, the, the broadcast, we start that about uh, 12.20, which is about... Um, 1222 right now but so we're with you almost on time but um, we do that because I'm only streaming the message part of the service and I hope that you all are tuning in and I hope if you like this message that you will share it with other people I mean that's one way that we can um, minister to other people if you find a great message and I hope this you consider this to be a great message that you will take it and that you will share it with others and bless them and it will bless the ministry as well so uh, without further ado, uh, my message today, uh, as you can see right here on the overhead, is that is don't play with fire. And we're going to get into that in more detail. Every once in a while, a sermon will come along that will lift your spirits, uh, that will give you hope of a wonderful and bright future. And sometimes it may even give you a, one of those warm, fuzzy feelings inside. Well... This isn't one of those messages. No, it's not. I'm sorry, y'all. Sometimes it is necessary to deliver a fire and brimstone type of message using vivid type of descriptions. And um, uh, we want to talk about judgment. We want to talk about eternal damnation. Because when you are aware of those things, some people are, don't even never talk about that or never hear that type of message. But when you talk about those things, this kind of brings around that there's need for repentance mm -hmm. so that you don't have to experience those things on that side of the, of the, of the experience. And I like to bring to light um, 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 7 through 9. And it says, And you are... And you, I mean, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall reveal, from, shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. The one taking vengeance on them that know not God. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean like knowing of God, but who know not God. So there's a difference. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction, not a time out, not, not a, a little pat on the bottom, but with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. You'll be out of the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. These are the type of scriptures that we need to hear from time to time. Not how God is going to bless you, but how God is going to punish you. You need to know that, that side of the coin as well. This message has its challenges. This is uh, one of those messages uh, that is not preached too often these days. It's not a prosperity message. It's not how to count your blessings, how to name it and claim it. No, this is um, a message that you need to pay attention to. I will do my best to present this in a way that uh, you can hear it and that you can uh, receive it and also apply it to your life. Mm -hmm. As a child, this, this is the thing I always like to tell stories to help get you at ease. As a child, I was fascinated with fire myself. Still am today. Fire department visit my home every once in a while. <laughs> uh, fire is colorful, it's animated, and it's dynamic. And a child's uh, curiosity about fire is natural, you know, especially young young boys. It's natural, but playing with fire can be dangerous, and that's why I have titled this message today: "Don't play with fire." I'll give you some examples. I'm going to tell some more stories. When I was a young boy, little boy, I was probably around nine, ten years old. You know, I, like I said, I love fire. I love just playing in fire. And I um, had a friend. Uh, his name is Fred. A childhood friend lived up the street from me. And well, let me tell you something about Fred. Fred was a character. 
I mean, and not just how he looked, because frail, he was very skinny, very thin, very frail, and he was very pale. You know, he was light skinned. And how do you, how would you recognize, or how could I put something to tell you what he looks like? If you imagine a toothpick, those uh, little plain toothpick, and you put eyeballs on it, well, that's Fred. And you know, the Fred was the kind of kid that was always in mischief, always in trouble. And it wasn't as though Fred wasn't looking for trouble. It seemed like trouble came looking for Fred. You know, and so on this one cold Saturday morning, Fred came knocking at the door, wanted to know if I could come out and play. And uh, yes, I, I went out to play. Uh, we love playing in the woods. The little boys love playing in the woods because we climb trees. Uh, we play with reptiles, you know, frogs and uh, crayfish and lizards and turtles and snakes and leeches and all kind of crazy <laughs> things in the woods. And uh, we just hung out in the woods and played all the time. Well, I, so we went to the woods and then Fred said, hey, let's build a fire. You know, and so we started, we found a clearing and started raking pine straw together. And uh, so I said, well, what you going to light it with? And Fred reached in his pocket and he pulled out some matches. <laughs> but in, also, in addition to the matches, he reached in his other pocket and pulled out a cigarette that he had taken from his mom. See, Fred always had a, 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 a different motive, uh, and something, a different agenda. You know, and so we, I wasn't going to smoke it. You know, I was like, I was a young kid, but Fred would do that. He was a year younger than me. But anyway, when we was raking the pine straw together, I uncovered an aerosol can. It was a little rusty and all. So I picked it up and I'm trying to spray it. Nothing comes out. And I could tell something was in it because there was something sloshing around when I would shake it up. And I could hear that little ball pinging in there. And so I'm just pressing on the nozzle, hoping something would come out. But nothing would come out. So Fred, he got, we got the pine straw, and he lit the fire, we lit the pine straw, and we got a little fire going. So Fred, he sits on one side of the fire, and I sit on the other side. And I'm sitting on my bottom with the aerosol can between my legs, steady pressing on that nozzle. And Fred takes the cigarette out, and he's sitting across from me, and he takes it, and he puts it in his mouth, but he doesn't light it with the matches. He said, I'm going to do it like they do on the Westerns. So he tries to lean forward and light it <laughs> in the fire. And at the very moment he was leaning forward to light his cigarette, a burst of spray came out of the aerosol can, and it went into the fire, and a ball of fire came out the other end and wrapped itself around Fred's head. And he grabbed his face and he said, you burned me up, you burned me up. And all I could think to say was, don't tell, Fred, don't tell. You know, and so he said, you burned me up, I'm telling you. So I said, oh, let me help you out, Fred. I stood him up, and at that moment, Fred no longer looked like a toothpick. At that moment, he looked more like a, like a struck match because he had a stream of smoke ascending from his head. And I said, let me see, Fred. And I said, you look good. He said, oh, I don't. You will burn me up. And I said, let me clean you up. So I take my hand and I wipe it across his face. And his eyebrows came off in my hand. Oh, Lord. And I said, oh, Fred, so I'm going to tell on you. And so he took off running home. <laughs> so I ran home, too. And I live closer. And I get to my house. And my mom and dad are in the living room. So I said, hey, guess what? Um, Fred and I was in the wood. And I told him what happened. Guess what they did? They laughed. Now, what does that say about Fred when you say you burn somebody up and then and they laugh about it? But again, what does that say about my parents, too? <laughs> but, but anyway, the phone rang. Guess who it was? Fred's parents. It was Fred's mom on the phone. And she wanted to know who burned up my baby. So I wasn't going to lie. I told the truth, the half truth, and nothing but the truth. And I said, I said Fred was smoking in the woods, and then I heard the phone drop, and I heard what sounded like Fred was getting a whip. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, don't play with fire. Nope. That one more story before I get into the heart of the message. My friend Carlos, he lives across the street from me. I'm using the real names, and I hope they watch this thing. But uh, he lived across from me. We had a tree house on another part of the woods. And he knocked on the door and said, hey, you want to go hang out in the treehouse? And it was still cold. It was still in the wintertime. And so I said, sure. So we was walking up there, and he got a little tin can. I said, what you got, man? He said, 
Oh, that's a little gasoline. I said, what you gonna do with that? He said, so we can start a little fire in that Maxwell house can in the tree house to keep it warm. And I was like, okay. And so we get to the tree house and we get in there and Carlos said, you know, he put the pine straw and some paper tore it up in this Maxwell house can. He said, when I light this paper, I want you to pour the gas in there. I said, okay. So he struck the match and went to light the paper and I, I just dumped the gas in the Maxwell house can. I, I probably should have waited until he moved his hand out of the way. Um, yeah, I, I, hey, we're little kids. We don't think it through. And then when the moment I did that, the fire went, whoo, I fell back. Carlos fell back. And then I'll look up and he's like, he's shaking his hand and, and he's running around. The only thing I can think of to say was, don't tear Carlos. Don't tear him. And so he's there. And I look at him, I say, stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll. And he said, you burned me up. And then he just ran out the door. And let me remind you, we're in the treehouse. And so I looked down on the ground. He said, I'm going to tell my dad. And then he takes off and he runs home. So I run home too. When I get home, guess what? The phone rings. Guess who it is? It's Carlos' dad. He said, uh, I want you to tell me what took place here. What happened? I said, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth the half truth and nothing but the truth. And I said, Carlos took gas to the tree house and we was trying to start a fire and then the phone went dead. I can only imagine what happened. The moral of the story is, don't play with fire. Don't play with fire. See, my childhood stories, it may seem a little humorous or maybe not, it may be a little serious. But when I say don't play with fire, what I'm really saying is, you have to take it seriously. You can't play around with fire. You have to take it seriously. Amen. Because fire will burn you. So you cannot play with it. So I hope that my intro will have you your attention now so that you can receive the heart of this message. Because there is a fire mentioned in the Bible. And this fire is no laughing matter. I'm talking about the lake of fire. And you ever heard of the lake of fire? Yes. You know, most churches, they don't really say that word like it's taboo. But yeah, the lake of fire. The phrase lake of fire is found only five times in the Bible. And each occurrence of that is in the book of Revelation. So we're going to look at these scriptures, these occurrences of where the word uh, lake of fire is mentioned. The first scripture we come to is Revelation chapter 19 and 20. Listen to the detail of these scriptures. Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles uh, before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. We're talking about the beast and the false prophet. So let's look at Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelations 20, 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death. I'm going to talk about that later. Revelations 20, 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's very important. How do you get your name in the book of life? You have to be saved. We'll talk about that later. Now, this next occurrence, this fifth occurrence of the lake of fire is a little bit different, but it's, it's still talking about the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire, which is that's the lake of fire, and brimstone, which is the second 
death. There's that word again, that phrase, the second death. The Old Testament passages also speak of God raining brimstone and fire upon the wicked. So only the wicked are going to experience this. And who are the wicked? The ungodly. Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of the heaven, out of heaven. Psalms 11, 6. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone. Keep hearing this fire and brimstone. And a horrible tempest, this great storm. Uh, this shall be the portion of their cup. And that cup they're talking about is cup of judgment. You know, I'm, I'm getting away from the message a while for a second, like I always do. I'm uh, talking about this cup. Remember, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, take this cup away. You know, and so, but that was a cup of salvation that had to take place to prevent the saved ones from taking part, having part of the cup of judgment. And that's what they were talking about here. And so this one is talking about the cup of ju judgment, which is their portion for their deed on earth. Pay back to the scheduled broadcast. Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 22. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him an overflowing rain and great hailstones. Let's like brimstone, just fire coming down. Uh, fire and brimstone. So it's, it's going to be a terrible thing. You know, when the flood came, there was water coming up out of the earth, and there was water coming from the sky, and it's, well, it's going to be the same thing, but it's going to be fire this time. Mm -hmm. Think about water. Water is used to purify things. We clean with water. Mm -hmm. The same with fire. Fire can, can purify things. Mm -hmm. And that's what God is doing. He purified it with water before, and now he's purifying the earth with fire. Mm -hmm. So, the references to fire and brimstones are in connection with the lake of fire mentioned in the passages of the book of Revelation, which we already went over, which was chapter 19, verse 20, and also chapter 20, verse 10. So, this fire is a punishment or it's a judgment from God. You don't want to play with this fire. Take it seriously. You don't want to experience it. The following scriptures further define this fire that you should definitely take serious. We're looking now in Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 and 42. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, all the things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, which is the lake of fire that we're talking about, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. This fire, this lake of fire was for the devil and his angels. It wasn't for us until we became followers. Or just, I hate saying we. When they became followers of the devil and his angels and his demons. And so when you allow them to influence you and you, uh, you live under that influence, now you also become part of the judgment of that lake of fire that was meant for them. Revelation chapter 20, verse 13 and 15. It says, And the sea gave up the dead that which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I'm talking about that again, the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I have another two-part series called uh, Death and Hell. And um, it's going to, it talks about this in a little more detail. It's two-part because 
you know, death, you know, what happens when you die, people want to know that. And I talk about that. Then the other part is hell. And I, I go into detail about hell <laughs> or uh, what hell is. And <clears throat> it's very interesting because I tell you where hell is and where the lake of fire is in that message. Maybe I'll do it in a few months or so. But um, it's on the YouTube, it's on Facebook, Death and Hell, Part 1 and 2, if you want to look at it before I actually present it in, in service again. Okay, um, people probably do not think too much about where they will spend their eternity. It's not on the top 10 of their bucket list. They don't think about salvation. They're like, I want to go to Jamaica. I want to eat, eat this certain food or <coughs> go to this certain place. So, but so many times I have tried to tell people about Jesus and salvation only to be rejected, only to be ignored. And, you know, I'm, that happens more time than those who want to hear. Um, I have attended quite a few funerals in my day. And they make it seem as though everyone is going to heaven. They do. I mean, if you listen to what they say, everybody, they, they, they're they gang related, just shot up and killed a dozen people. I think they're going to heaven. Yeah. They repented that the police shot them down. But I mean, just saying, that's a whole nother story. Let me get back. I often heard that the dearly departed was in a better place. That's what they were saying during their eulogy. And I wish that was so. I really do wish that was so. Because I don't want to wish hell and death or lake of fire on anyone. I will never, ever, never have and never will tell anyone to go to that place. Mm -hmm. Never. Because um, I want people to be changed, not to be punished in that way. Give them a punishment, give them a life punishment to change them, but people are not paying attention. Some people think coming to church is their punishment. <laughs> and maybe in some cases it might be. But we need to be told these things that I'm talking about. It's not all glamorous. We have there's a God of wrath as well. He's a God of love. Yes. That's why he's going to destroy all this wickedness. So we can live in love forever. Though, so, but the reality um, over everybody being saved going to heaven is that um, most people will go to the lake of fire. Most people. The scripture tells us that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. There are so many ways, so many things that will lead you off the straight and narrow path, the path of righteousness, to all these other avenues to wherever you, it life takes you. But that broad way of destruction, and many there will be, which there be which go in there at. So most people, he says many of them, are going to find that broad way that leads to destruction. And the sad thing is that, like I said earlier, they, people think everybody's going to heaven. And the majority will not. <clears throat> the scripture is saying that there will be only a few people that will have salvation. Um, the concerning thing is that just about everybody believe that practically everyone will go to heaven. They tell me I'm pessimistic when I say what I'm saying, but I'm just repeating what the scripture says, and I'm realistic when it comes to this. What could possibly be worth the lake of fire? Was doing was committing that sin worth eternal damnation? No. Was stealing that thing, was murdering this person? No, it's not worth it. There are influences all around us, though, that cause us to sin. <clears throat> Satan, of course, causes us to sin, his influence. Our flesh, we want to pleasure our flesh, we want to please our flesh through various ways. It causes us to sin. Um, the world causes us to sin. I mean, the world is full of enticements and influences that will lead you on that broad way, that way to destruction. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So 
those things will cause you to sin when you lust after those things. Sin should be taken seriously. Jesus warned us about it. I'm going to look at the book of Mark, chapter 9, verse 43 through 48. I'm going to show it to you in three parts. Mark, chapter 9, verse 43 and 44. It says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell and to the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So he didn't say go cut your hands off to keep from going to this place or having that happen. He is saying that it's better to go through life maimed. So say, I'm going to steal. He said, don't steal. It's better to cut your hands off to keep you from stealing. But he's not saying literally do that. He's saying it's better to do that than to go into this life. Mark chapter 9, verse 45 and 46. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life. You know, don't go where if your feet take you places, you don't want to go there because it's better. He said, then having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm, di worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Again, that my, my message on death and hell, the hell part, is really going to go into these and you'll be surprised as to what all of these things really mean. Okay, and how they really are. Moving on, Mark chapter 9, verse 43 and 48. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell's fire, into hell fire, where the worm dieth not. And the fire is not quenched. Images. Of course, this is just what artists put together. I don't know about you, but I don't want my family, I don't want my friends, and I don't want any of you to experience the second death and burn up in the lake of fire. You cannot just stop, drop, and roll and to extinguish this fire, mm -hmm. <laughs> this lake of fire. It yeah. won't work. It would not work. If I could see Fred today, I would tell him that Jesus Christ died for his sins. I would tell him that. If I could talk to Carlos right now, I would tell him about God's plan of salvation. I would teach them how to be on fire for the Lord. And when I say to be on fire for the Lord, I'm talking about that Holy Ghost fire. I'm talking about that good kind of fire to have. To be on fire for the Lord is the kind of fire that is purifying. It's that purifying fire that keeps you uh, uh, hyped on the, the goodness of the Lord. Imagine if the whole world could be on fire for the Lord. Think about it. There are so many people that you can set on fire. When you like to set some people on fire, this way, I mean, this way. I mean, for instance, that friend who is depressed, tell them about the joy of the Lord. Light them up. That's right. What about that family member with the addiction? Addiction. Tell them how God can deliver them. Light them up. That church member who needs encouragement, remind them to put their trust in the Lord. Light them up. That co-worker who is lost, tell them about Jesus' saving grace. Light them up. That man at the gas station, light them up. The woman at the grocery store, light them up. Your next door neighbor, light them up. Light them up. Light them up. Let's set this whole world on fire for God. That's why we are here. That's what we have come to do. I have one final story to share. One night a respected pastor had a dream of an angry man rummaging through waist deep fire, picking up bodies and throwing them back down, looking before looking into their eye, after looking into their eyes. Uh, it was as though he was hunting for someone particular. 
This angry man was searching through the fire. He was going from person to person, hastily picking them up, all these tormented bodies, one by one, and throwing them down after seeing that they were not the person he was looking for. After, at this point, you might be asking, who is this angry man looking for in this fire, in this lake of fire? The next morning, the pastor who had this dream was distraught at such a horrid vision. Uh, and so he asked the Lord, he said, um, what does, does this dream mean? What did it mean for me to have this dream? The Lord simply said, this is an angry man in the lake of fire looking for the preacher that lied to him. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's right. <laughs> the angry man had sat under a pastor who was more interested in building his own personal kingdom mm -hmm. here on earth instead of God's kingdom. He, he told the people what they wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear, which is the full counsel of divine truth. So I'm going to tell you here, I don't care if you don't want to hear it, hear it, it is my responsibility to tell you what you need to hear. This naive man, now in eternal damnation, like many others who did not study God's word for themselves, they consequently bought into the lie thinking that they would be in heaven. People need to know this. They need to know this side of the Bible. Yes. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 and 12. And with all deceivability, deceivability, uh, I'm sorry, with all and with all deceivableness, let me get this word right. With all deceivableness <laughs> of unrighteousness. In them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. They were all deceived. Yeah, it's hard to say, isn't it? Deceivableness. Deceivableness. Yeah. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Kind of remind me of Pharaoh when his heart was hard. But, you know, he's, Pharaoh did what he wanted to do because his heart was already hard. And people, they want to believe a lie. Some people don't want the truth. They can't handle the truth. So they want, they rather believe a lie and live a life that is fun. Continue, it says, but they had the pleasure, their pleasures in unrighteousness. They wanted to be enticed. They wanted to uh, enjoy the, the flesh, the world, even Satan himself. That's why some worship him. So I began this message saying that it is something sometimes necessary to preach a fire and brimstone uh, judgment and eternal damnation type of message to encourage you to repent. Repentance is more than saying, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me. True repentance is more than that. It's changing your life to avoid that second death. It's turning away from those wicked things and turning toward God. That's what true repentance is. And you see a lot of people, or hear a lot of people talk about salvation, and they never mention repentance. There is no salvation without repentance. It's not saying a prayer. You can't tell me, show me anywhere in the Bible where you say a simple prayer and uh, admit that you're a sinner and say, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. No, Jesus didn't say, accept me as your personal Savior. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can't say, the Lord is my, I accept my personal Savior. You keep doing all this wickedness because you do all of that. You're a hypocrite and you're fooling yourself. Amen. All of you say that they will believe a lie. That's them believing a lie. Repentance is changing your life. What is the second death I keep mentioning? That the scripture keeps mentioning? That is. Before I answer that, what that second death is, let me say this before I say that. Everyone is born once. Everybody here has been born once, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody, yeah, I thought so. Everybody's been born once. However, Christians are born again. 
That is what we say when a person receives salvation. They change their life. They repent it. They, they believe in God. They have uh, been baptized in Jesus' name. They receive the Holy Ghost. That's salvation. That's being born again. In John chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So there's no exception to this rule. You have to be born again. You must be saved according to scripture. I'm talking about scripture salvation. I'm not talking about man's salvation. I'm talking about believing repentance, uh, baptized in Jesus' name. I'm talking about uh, receiving the Holy Ghost. That's the only way to be born again. So when people die, that's the first death. You know, we're all going to die, uh, uh, you know, being that the Lord tarries, tarries and, you know, wait. So not everybody's going to die because when the Lord comes, those who are alive are going to be instantly, instantly changed. They're going to be taken. So they're going to be like Enoch and, and uh, Elijah, right? Mm -hmm. So the second death comes after judgment. It is the punishment of being thrown into the lake of fire. It is a total and final separation from God. <clears throat> That's the second death. So my thing is this. I'm going to close with this right here. If you are born only once, you will have two deaths. A natural death and then that eternal death in the lake of fire. But if you are born twice, you only have one death. Ooh, glory. Amen. And you will live forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your scriptures that we can all that we all can uh, have access to lord god to read it for ourselves so that we can know and learn lord god that we may not believe a lie that comes from the enemy that comes from the world lord and father god i just want you to i just want to say to you lord god that um, you are a mighty god you're an awesome god you're the true god the creator of all things the lord of lords and the king of kings father we're very grateful that you are mindful of us, Lord God, that you have provided your instruction on how we should live and how we are to um, survive, Lord God, this world, this wicked place that it became. And we know that you're going to restore it to what it was supposed to be, Lord God. And we ask that you come into our lives, Lord God, in the midst of everyone who's listening, Lord God, and convict them. Let them know that they need to examine themselves and compare it to your word. Whatever doesn't line up, then they have to change so that they can avoid this eternal punishment in the lake of fire. Thank you, Father God. I love you with all my being, with all my soul and might, all my strength. And I say to those who are listening, Father God, don't play with fire. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you all for tuning in. I uh, hope you join me next week. Don't know what the message will be, but I assume it will be something. I think I know what it might be. Um, I had a thought, and um, the, the thought that came to mind was do's and don'ts. Do's and don'ts. So tune in next week so you can hear about the do's and the don'ts. Thank you all for joining.